Hi, I'm Michael Killen, and I interview people who have good minds in an effort to help them share their knowledge, their wisdom with you. And I came across a book called The Tipping Point for the Planet Earth. And I have a sense as to what a book like that is all about, and I think some of you do too. There's been a lot of changes, a lot of developments in our planet, you know, including rapid growth of population, uh, increasing carbon emissions in the air, warming, warming generated by people, warming developed by other factors. And these are stressing our planet. And it is important for all of us to gain a better understanding of the situation we are in now and where things are going, especially so we make sure we are not the sixth extinction. So my guest is Tony Banowski. And he is the author of this book, The Tipping Point for Planet Earth. And I'm going to ask him a series of questions about this book and about what is he doing. Tony, I hope I pronounced your name properly. That was close enough, Michael. It's Tony Barnosky. And would I be safe to say, let's see, you're an educator to a good extent. And you spent many years at California University in Berkeley. Correct. And you are into history, right? Um, deep history, yes. Deep history, long history. And maybe you want to tell us what kind of history has interested you so much. Sure. My, uh, my background is in paleontology, and specifically paleoecology, which means that I use the fossil record to try to understand how big changes that took place on the planet in the past actually affected living systems. And the whole reason for doing that is to try to understand how the big changes we're seeing today actually compare with the past and whether we really are living in a unique age. So you look at the fossil records, and these are records from millions and millions of years ago. Is that correct? Um, yes. So the fossil records I look at uh, stretch back millions of years, but really most of the focus in my work has been on looking at what happens over the last, say, 20,000 years. And that was a very important time because it was a time when um, the human population was finally expanding so that Homo sapiens got to every continent uh, on the planet, say Antarctica. Um, it was also a time when climate was changing at a magnitude that is very much like we're seeing today, but, but at a much slower rate. So you put those two things together, and we saw some interesting events in the natural world. So did you say your emphasis has been on the last 20,000 years? Pretty much the last 20,000 years, yes. And during that period, you have evidence now of significant changes in the planet, uh, in the in the uh, climate and, and other? Yeah, yes, that's, that's uh, absolutely right. So um, it turns out that about 11,700 years ago, we went from an ice age, which much of the northern hemisphere was covered by a mile of ice, into uh, what we call our present interglacial, uh, where the ice melted, climate stabilized, and human civilization actually developed. So we can look at that time period and try to understand how that magnitude of change both um, influenced humanity and also influenced other species on the planet. I may have to come back to a point there, but in the last 20,000 years, there's never been an extinction, a mass, or maybe there has a loss of life, uh, vegetation, et cetera. Is that correct? Well, has, well has it, there been? It, it, it turns out that, yes, there was a very dramatic extinction event that took place pretty much precisely at the two events I just mentioned, the, the growth of human population to where we hit uh, most continents on the planet, um, combined with climate change. And we actually saw the extinction of about half of all the large-bodied animals on Earth at that time. Oh, was that 
the extinction that was caused by a meteor hitting? No, no that was earlier. Uh, the, yes, um, the uh, earlier extinction that you just mentioned is the dinosaur extinction. That was about 66 million years ago. If we look back at the history of the planet over the last half a billion years, and that's all the time that complex life has been on the planet, we see that there were five times where we have what we call mass extinctions. And by mass extinctions, we mean about 75% of familiar species breathe their last uh, over a geologically short period of time. Okay, so over half a billion years, is that the number you used? Five times there have been mass extinctions on this planet. So if that's happened five times already, it's reasonable to consider that it could happen a sixth time, couldn't it? That's absolutely right. Um, so, so because it's happened five times before, and we have very, very good geological and paleontological evidence uh, to document that, we know that these big things, these big events happen on the planet and change it forever. And therefore, we know that it can happen again. And in fact, um, what we're seeing right now is what many uh, scientists are calling the sixth mass extinction. The difference being this time it's one species, us, Homo sapiens, that's driving it. So in effect, we're like that meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs. OK, so I read in your book that in your lifetime and mine, population has increased by a billion people. Is that correct? Um, in, in my lifetime, population has almost tripled. When I was born, there were about 2.6 billion people on the planet. Now there are 7.4 billion and growing. We have never seen that steep a rise in population in human history before. So what? Uh, we have a lot of people. We got a lot of land. Um, well, it's, it's interesting when you start thinking about how many people versus how much land. It turns out that um, as of today, people have taken over about 50% of the Earth's land surface for their own needs, which means they're taking it out of play for other species for the most part. Um, now, if you do the math on that, you sort of you realize very quickly that that means that each one of us is taking about two acres of the planet to live the lifestyle we're accustomed to. And that's, you know, that's on average. That's some people would, would have a lifestyle that uses a lot less. Some people would have a lifestyle that loses, uses a lot more. But on average, about two acres per person. So now if you run that into the future, and you think we're going to have 3 billion more people on the planet by 2050, which pretty much any demographic uh, um, projection is giving us, um, the math doesn't work out very well for how much land there is left. Because we've already taken the best land. And the only places left that we can use are deserts, mountaintops, and the last remaining reservoirs of biodiversity, the rainforests. OK, so I heard you say something like this. Uh, we've already taken 50% of the usable land for the most part. No, 50% of, <clears throat> 50 of all the land. Of all <clears throat> the land. And we therefore have taken resources away from other living uh, creatures and making it more difficult for them to survive, mm -hmm. making it, maybe even with our roads and everything, making it difficult for them to migrate as they may have to yeah, migrate exactly, because yes, of changing yes. climate and, and food supplies. So we are contributing to the extinction of other species. And then I heard you say, we have two acres. And I guess that's for us to grow our food get our water, maybe, and uh, maybe for our habitat. Mm -hmm. And I heard you say a lot more people are coming as things stand right now. And that means uh, there'll be a shortage of resources like land, water, food, et cetera. And I think I read in your book, you wrote about people in Africa 
Wanda, maybe, mm -hmm. and when resources get scarce, we fight over them. Is that? Well, yeah. So I mean, it's it's interesting. Um, so this book, Tipping Point uh, for Planet Earth, which which by the way I wrote with my wife Elizabeth Hadley, uh, who's who's also a scientist um, at Stanford University, um, and we've, we've you know we've traveled throughout the world and and, and seen these places. Um, but the whole point of this book is that we, as we think about going into the future, we, th we tend to think about problems as being isolated from one another. So we think about climate change, or we think about population growth, or we think about income equality, or, or we think about water shortages or fuel shortages. Um, it turns out that all of those things are intimately related. Um, and if you begin to recognize that, that's, it's both, you know, it's bad news and good news. The bad news is there are all these big problems out there. But the good news is that since they're interrelated, if you make significant progress on solving any one of them, you can end up helping many other facets as well. And the big one uh, that's the ultimate driver right now is how many people there are on the planet. Um, not only that, how much each of us uses to live the lifestyle we think we need to live. And are you comfortable that the forecasts we have, I think I see UN forecasts always to 2050. Mm -hmm. uh, correct me if I'm incorrect. And things are going to go like that and then level off. So they're going to continue to go higher, increase, and then they level off. Is that the thinking? Well, so it, 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 it very much depends on what the human race decides to do. <laughs> um, so here's a scary thing. If um, fertility rates, that is birth rates balancing death rates, um, continued to be what they were over the last decade or so, no change whatsoever, um, we would have 27 billion people on the planet by the year 2100. Now, no um, person who studies these things in detail thinks that's going to happen because birth rates actually have been coming down. So if birth rates fall fairly rapidly so that in every country where we're not at replacement rate, that is about two kids per family, um, we get to replacement rate then we get that leveling off you just mentioned, and that's at a little over 10 billion people. Yeah. If we uh, somehow went a half a child less than replacement rate on average, then it hits close to 10 billion and drops back down and stabilizes at about 7 billion where we are today. Yeah. So, so that's the range of scenarios that are out there. But the important thing to notice is that any one of those scenarios puts you at close to 10 billion people by 2050. So that's the world we have to plan for. And, and that means uh, that two acres uh, is not two acres anymore that I have. That, that, that means that on a per person basis, we have to be using less as we go into the future. That is, we have to be more efficient in uh, how we use the planet. So your book says how title, the subtitle sort of is, how close are we to the edge. And I heard you say, that, you know, there's different developments and maybe if one area, I heard you say uh, mm -hmm. income equality or uh, if that uh, gap continues to grow, the economic gap, that gap, that could acerbate, cause problems in other areas like, sure. uh, like food, mm -hmm. water, land, uh, and does that lead us to the topic of what might be a tipping point? And maybe, is that sure. right? And if so, yeah, yeah. would you define a tipping point? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's um, basically when we talk about tipping points, we talk about sudden changes. Now, if, if you think about the way things change, really, and it doesn't have to just be in biological systems, any system. If you think about the way things change, um, there's, there's two different possibilities. One 
is you push a little bit and something moves a little bit and then you push a little bit more and it moves a little bit more. So you can always predict by the amount of pressure you're putting on it where you're going to end up. Okay, so that's called a, 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 a linear change. There's also nonlinear changes and that means you push a little bit and it moves where you expect it. You push a little bit more and it moves where you expect it. You push a little bit more and then boom, something really sudden happens that you weren't expecting. That's a tipping point. And a good, um, you know, a, a, a easy way to conceptualize that is if you made a pot of tea this morning or boiled water for coffee, you put the kettle on the stove, the water got hotter, hotter, and hotter. You didn't really notice anything happening until all of a sudden it started to boil. There was the tipping point. That's a tipping okay. point. And that's what we're used to, and, and we benefit mm -hmm. from making steam uh, sure. or whatever. Sure. And, and that's a tipping point that if you cool down the steam, it goes back to water. Now, there are other kinds of tipping points where once you go over the edge, there's no going back. And a good way to conceptualize that is an egg rolling towards the edge of the table, and it goes to the edge of the table, hits the tipping point, falls off, hits the ground and breaks, that egg is never going to be the same again. That's the sort of tipping point we're talking about in our book. Okay, let's see. Andy Grove, one of the founders, CEO of Intel, talked about tipping points as the angle of inflection. Would, mm -hmm. would you agree that's another way? Sure, that's another way to think about it, that you're, you're going along at a fairly steady trajectory, and then all of a sudden the trajectory changes very rapidly. And geometric uh, impacts or reactions occur. Right, you get, you get a much uh, greater reaction than you were expecting. Okay, so we're always expecting to go like that, and then all of a sudden, whoosh, yeah, like an exponential exactly. phenomenon yes, yeah. occurs and we lose control. That's right. And, then, and something happens that, that we're not ready for, and that's when yeah. bad things happen. And then you pointed back, you pointed out that you can't go backwards. Exactly. You're stuck. So when you look at all the different domains in our, our world that we are involved in, water, air, whatever, uh, food, mm -hmm. Have, do you have a special, do you think specially about one of those domains that might be one of the first to tip? I, you know, I think that we're seeing uh, tipping points already. Um, one example is climate change. Now, um, in, in 1988, we had the big fires in the western U.S. That was uh, the year that Yellowstone, half of Yellowstone oh, National sure. Park burnt, okay? It wasn't just Yellowstone, it was all over the western United States. That, that was a unique event up to that time. Ever since then, that much acreage has been, and more, has been burned every year. So we went from, just like the the, the water heating up and turning to steam. Those forests were drying out, drying out, drying out year by year. They hit that critical point where ignition was very easy, and that's where we've been ever since. Now, that was, that's a climate-triggered tipping point. Um, uh, so, so we've seen those kinds of things already. So are you saying now we're going to see more of these well, forests. yes, yes. So the way tipping points work, obvious, in, in, in the case of uh, um, climate, for example, is first we saw the gradual change of the, the, the overall warming in those forests. And then we hit this new normal where forest fire frequency essentially doubled. Um, but now things are still heating up. So, so we're going to hit another one and another one and another one. And at some point, there'll be a, a major tipping okay. point. And since you're the expert, correct me, but with each forest fire, more carbon emissions, greenhouse gases go up into the atmosphere, and they hang around for a long time. And as more and more 
gases go up there, they contribute to, to even more warming. And sure. that contributes yeah. to warming of the forest and and the cycle increases, mm -hmm. increases, mm -hmm. maybe, is that? Yeah, so there's those feedbacks. And, and, and deforestation, uh, as you mentioned, is a great example. So if trees and forests are alive and healthy, they're actually drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere, a very so important good. greenhouse gas. Um, if you lose them from a fire, say, or from, as is happening throughout um, many of the world's rainforests, through cutting them down, all of a sudden you don't have that service of, of them su uh, sucking up CO2 anymore and, and the problem gets worse. So, so those sorts of feedbacks are, are quite important in, in building tipping points. Okay, a difficult question that you're not expecting, but it'd be wonderful if okay. you had a good answer. I am thinking about making a painting that articulates, captures uh, the essence of climate or mm -hmm. ocean tipping mm -hmm. points. Mm -hmm. Okay, climate. What would you think I should include in a painting like that? What kind of imagery? Oh, that's an interesting question. And and you know, I think what comes to mind um, in the terrestrial realm, that is on land, uh, fires, extreme storms. Um, in, in the oceans, uh, I think something very dramatic could be on the horizon, and that is loss of, of most of the world's coral reefs. Um, now, the, 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 that, that would be from climate change in the form of making the oceans more acid. All right. So, so, so in terms of a painting, you know, you're going from bright, vibrant to um, dull white, essentially. In, in terms of planetary impacts, if you lose coral reefs, you're wiping out 25% of the species in the oceans. You're wiping out 10% of the world's fisheries. Uh, and you're wiping out the source of protein for a good uh, number of millions of people that rely on that as their basic source of protein. So all of a sudden you have a lot of hungry, poor people and um, problems start. All right, that is very helpful to me. And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna watch this TV show, this video again, just to, to listen again to what you said, uh, because it could be Well, very good, helpful. I wanna see the painting. <laughs> yes, so, um, you and your wife wrote this book, and I remember hearing your wife give a speech, and she talked about being in Yellowstone, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. And I noticed something you have tried to do, and I think you've done it fairly successfully. You tried to make this, this scientific book accessible to uh, the layperson. Mm -hmm. And I can tell from the stories and the travel information, information about your daughters, and et cetera, you have succeeded. I oh, think. Thank you. Uh, and it's a valuable book. I was wondering, since you brought up the time period of 20,000 years, I want to share this painting uh, is within, I focused on the time period of the Lascaux Caves, which were mm -hmm. when the people were making cave art in that 20,000 years ago. And I imagined that the way we are going, we might be heading off the cliff. Mm -hmm. but, and before we go off the cliff, we will have made paintings on our walls, etc. You know, words like E equals MC square, somebody with an iPhone. Uh, we have crosses all over the place and stars. And if we go off the cliff, maybe uh, two million, four million years, some new people will come yeah. along, <laughs> may not look like us, and they would find our art, and there's a little Matisse uh -huh. up there, uh -huh. and they would paint their art over us. And that thinking led to this painting yeah. 
which is in your scope of history to it's, an extent. It, you know, it's, 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 it's wonderful. And, and when I look at that painting, if I had to put a title on that painting, I would call it the Anthropocene. And what is the Anthropocene? The Anthropocene is, um, in essence, a, a new period of geological time that is that scientists are are figuring out whether it's it's legitimate from a scientific point of view but it's based on the impacts of human beings on the earth and the evidence for that and so you know you like you may have heard or remember from uh, way back in school, the Pleistocene and Pliocene and Miocene, the scenes, right? So nope. anyway, those are all divisions of geological okay. time. So the Anthropocene is one that is based on the impacts of humans. Okay, so that's very helpful to me. No, I didn't get that in school. I, I got <laughs> that a little bit, reading books and, and meeting people like you. Now, you are a professor emeritus at Stanford. I'm a professor emeritus at UC Berkeley. Okay. I'm, I'm at Stanford now. My, my real job is now at Stanford um, as the executive director of Jasper Ridge Biological Preserve. Okay, you've been a wonderful guest. I've learned a lot. And I like this book. I hope you go out and get your hands on it. You'll learn a lot. And I'll briefly state uh, two little announcements and one of them is uh, my art will be out on display starting November 1st at Atherton's Town Center and then in uh, I'll probably have this painting on display there and then February in the San Geromino Valley of Marin County I'm also going to have an art exhibition so that's those two. And probably the next painting I make, uh, it just might be the tipping point. And uh, with that, I want to say I'm Michael Killen, and I'm with Tony Bonowski. And we've been discussing this book. And then he has another book, which is Dodging Extinction. And I think uh, it's been wonderful opportunity, and I thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. So just stay here for a okay. while. I would say it was a very casual. <laughs>